Galileo, Galileo, Galileo Figaro, Magnifico, I'm just a poor boy from a poor family, he's just a poor boy from a poor family, sparing his life from this monstrosity, do, 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 do. easy come, easy go, will you let me go, it's Milano, we will not let you go, let me go, it's Milano, we will not let you go, let me go, we will not let you go, let me go, we will not let you go, let me go, no, 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 oh, mamma mia, mamma mia, mamma mia, let me go. <laughs> okay. That was a little bit of Queen for you. Freddy? Or me? It's close, I know. In the early 1600s, Galileo had been hearing about some in the marketplace curved glass that seemed to be giving an unusual effect. Uh, there were glass makers in Holland who were very well renowned for this. And so he ordered some and he brought in a couple of lenses. Okay. And most people were using them because they'd make your friend's face look funny or you could magnify the writing on the page. Uh, but what Galileo did that was unique from anybody else is he put two of them together because when he put two of them together, he got a great magnification. Now, he wouldn't be the only one to have done this, but historically, he may have been the first person not to just look across the ocean and say, land ho, but he did this. <gasps> and he saw things that nobody had ever seen before. And what Galileo did is what probably anybody would do if they got a telescope. The first thing was, look at the moon. And he looked at the moon, and right away he could see shadows, he saw craters, he saw curvature, that this object was round, it had undulations and imperfections. And at the time, of course, the uh, belief was that the heavenly bodies were in fact perfect. And Galileo said, well, um, except for one thing, the moon is not perfect. It's got a very irregular, bumpy surface. It's not a crystal ball. Then he said, um, what about the sun? So he devised a way to look at the sun. He allowed the light to pass through his telescope onto a, a white sheet. In doing so, he got a projection of the sun. And he would look at the sun on a regular basis. And what he would see from time to time were black spots. Imperfections again. These are what we now know as sunspots. They're... Um, regions of the sun's surface that come and go uh, still under study and uh, research. But they definitely showed an imperfection, almost like a blemish. He continued his studies. He decided to look at Venus. And as he watched Venus over time, he saw that Venus went through phases. Sometimes it was a crescent Venus. Sometimes it was a gibbous Venus. Sometimes Venus appeared larger, and sometimes it appeared smaller. That could only mean one thing. It was in motion. So when it appeared larger, it was closer. And as it got further away, in other words, as it was going around the sun, it got smaller. And as it changed its angle of attack from the light of the sun coming off of it at different angles, he saw phases of Venus just like the moon. The only way you could explain phases is if the planet was going around the sun. Then he looked at Jupiter. And this blew the doors off of everything. Because when he looked at Jupiter for the first time, he saw four points of light. Now, the first night, they may not have been that exciting. But the next night, when he looked again, those four points had changed their positions. And he continued to look night after night. And there would be sometimes he would look and there would be three points. Sometimes there would be two on this side and one on this side. Sometimes there would be two and two. And sometimes there would be three and one or one and three. And it seemed that those points of light were objects of some sort going around Jupiter. Well, then he sort of started to talk about this. And the response, though, was, wait a minute. If they're going around Jupiter, that means they're not going around Earth. And we live in a geocentric universe. You know that, right? This has been ordained by the church. So if they're going around Jupiter, they're not going around Earth. This can't be true. 
Galileo said, I've built this device, it's called a telescope. Look for yourself. And they looked at this telescope and said, well, what, what is this? That's, that's not a scientific instrument. That is a sorcerer's stick, and you've cast a spell on us to make us see these things. Well, what could Galileo do? Galileo was called before the, the authorities, the Vatican, and was told, you can't talk about this stuff. Your research is contrary to the church's teachings at the time. And Galileo agreed and signed in the mid-16, around 1618, a piece of paper that said, I won't talk about this anymore. And he went back on his merry way. He continued to do his research. He continued to be very sure about his work. So what did he do? He, like another uh, contemporary, wrote a play. I know there's another fellow by the name of William Shakespeare, writing plays at the time, gaining a lot of popularity. Galileo said, well, I'll write a play. And so he did, and it was called The Discussion of the Two Worldviews. And there are various characters in this play, and one of the characters was very much a Ptolemaic, geocentric supporter, and the other was a Copernican, heliocentric supporter. Now, the uh, Ptolemaic supporter was given a name in the play, and his name was Simplicio. Now, if I called you Simplicio, you would take that as an insult. I'd be calling you simple. And what Galileo did further was he quoted the Pope. Simplicio in the play quoted the Pope. Now, of course, this becomes public knowledge. The Pope hears about this and says, okay, we've, we've got to talk to you, Galileo, uh, because I'm not very happy about you comparing me to this simple individual. And so they called him back to the Vatican, and this was the Great Inquisition. And um, they, they said to him, you said you wouldn't talk about your discoveries and your theories about a sun-centered universe, and you did. Remember you signed this paper that said you wouldn't do that? Galileo said, I, I didn't really, I just wrote a play. And they said, no, 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 we've read between the lines, and we know what you're actually saying here, so you broke your promise. And therefore, you have two choices. Death by burning at the stake. Didn't seem like a good choice. Second choice was house arrest. And you'll go back to your home in Rome, and you will never leave it again and under house arrest for the rest of your life. Well, Galileo decided to pick the latter. And off he went to his home, where he spent the last 12 years of his life. The legend is that as the Inquisition ended and he got up from his chair, he whispered under his breath and a few people nearby heard Galileo say, E per si nueve, which means, and yet it moves. <laughs> and yet the earth moves. He knew it and he was right, but he did spend the rest of his life under house arrest.